potassium cyanide, carbon monoxide. Okay, cool. So moving right along the toxidromes, let's talk about the first toxidrome, and that is the cholinergic toxidrome. So when your patient looks like they have too much acetylcholine, that's how I remember cholinergic, too much acetylcholine, this is a parasympathetic response. This is generally caused by drugs that block the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. You guys remember that one, right? This is the enzyme that degrades. It, it, it helps hydrolyze acetylcholine down into acetic acid and choline, and then those get transported back into the, the neurons and the glial cells. So you block that enzyme, and acetylcholine does not break down. It stays out in the synaptic cleft, and it continues to agonize nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. What are some examples of agents? Your carbamates. Okay. Your carbamate and your organic phosphorus insecticides, and then your weaponized organic phosphorus agents. And we'll talk about some examples. And are you guys familiar with the NATO designation? Every potentially toxic or warfare agent is given a NATO designation. It's generally two, two letters, okay? Um, two capital letters, okay? So if you see the term GA, for example, okay? That is a type of nerve agent. And that is what's known as the G series of nerve agents. And the G series are called G because they originally came from the Germans originally developed these. And A is the very first agent that was developed, B, C, D, E, F. So GA was the first weaponized nerve agent that was developed in Germany in the late 1930s, and that's something called Taboon. GB was the next, and that's Sarin, okay? And, and then GD was another one, a little lot further down the line, called Solman. Okay, GF is called cycloserin. Okay, so if you run into a test question or somebody talking about this, they may either say serin or they may refer to it by its NATO code. Okay, so GB would be the same as serin. Does that, does that kind of make sense, what's going on there? And then you have special categories of agents that were developed later on. What, the most common one you hear is, is the, are the V agents, VX, okay, being the most common. Okay, and 
Um, the thing that you want to know about these is the G agents tend to be very volatile and the V agents tend to be very persistent. So your G agents tend to evaporate and become a gas very quickly, whereas your V agents tend to stick around. So your G agents are generally used when you want to hit a bunch of people and take them out. But the V agents are very good when you want to deny an area, right? Because they're, they're oil. They're basically very, very oily um, and kind of viscous. Um, and so you can spray a bunch of this in an area and you could deny that, th that area to the enemy. They're called area denial agents. Okay, This is also important for you as a provider because you know that the G agents, because they're very volatile, particularly like sarin, is so volatile that it tends to evaporate and go away or dissipate very quickly, Okay, whereas your V agents won't. So when it comes to scene safety, your G versus your V agents have some, um, some different nuances to them, if that makes sense. Okay, and guess what? These agents have been used um, more than once throughout the years, specifically sarin, GB, um, and it's actually been used uh, in a civilian setting, not in a military war setting. It's been used at least twice in a civilian setting that train in Japan. Japan. Yep, in, in Tokyo. In, uh, one very notable was in the subway. Um, the subway filled up with people. And then the doors closed, and they there were cult members. They were members of a of a of a religious fanatic cult, and they had what was called a binary compound, where they had plastic bags with two compounds, and when the compounds were put together, it produced sarin. And they literally just took two baggies and just kind of slapped them together, and then made the sarin. And you know, hundreds there were hundreds of casualties um, that, that occurred. Okay, so. Yeah, there you guys go. How do patients that have cholinergic toxidromes look? Remember sludge and the killer bees. Okay, so if you have too much acetylcholine, you've got salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI distress, emesis, and then this little guy here I threw all by itself, meiosis. What's meiosis? Uh, that is, but spelled this way is pupil constriction. Yeah, pu pupillary constrictions. Good. Good. And midriasis or midriasis or midriosis is pupil dilation, however you want to announce that. So you've got sludge and your killer bees bronchospasm, bronchorrhea, and bradycardia. You guys okay with that? All right. Remember. This doesn't have to be a weapons of mass destruction kind of or terrorist incident. It can be exposure to insecticides is the most common civilian problem we run into. There are also agents that people take therapeutically. For example, there is a neurological disorder called myasthenia gravis, right? That's a, par a, a paralytic disorder, a descending paralysis. Remember, myasthenia gravis is from the mind to the ground, right? That is a disease of acetylcholine receptors, all right? And so guess what? Patients take carbamates. We give them carbamate nerve agents to increase the amount of acetylcholine that they have in their, their, um, their neuromuscular junctions primarily, okay? So somebody could get a hold of those carbamates, overdose on them, and cause problems. Right. We, when we do asthma, when we test people with asthma and reactive airway disease, what do we do sometimes? To yeah, to cause bronchospasm, right? We give them methacholine. You guys have heard of that, the methacholine challenge? We give them a, a small dose of a carbamate that causes, bron causes them to have an asthma attack, basically, and we see how, um, how, res how responsive they are. Right, we we can test the hyper responsiveness of their airways um, with the methacholine. Right, somebody takes a bunch of that or has a problem with that. Okay, and certain ocular drugs as well for certain eye conditions um, are also carbamates. Okay, how do we treat these pe pe people? 
safety and decontamination first and foremost, right? Particularly if we're worried about persistent agents, right? If they have ingested something, is there a problem? What's the problem? If I've ingested a large amount of a nerve agent, what is a potential problem there? Okay, well for the patient, is there, a, is, there a, is there a safety decon problem? You can't decon. It's pretty hard to decon, but... There we go, off-gassing. Could that patient start off-gassing that agent, right? In a nice and closed ambulance. Yes, in a nice and closed ambulance. Something you want to think about, okay? Um, supportive care first and foremost, and then are there drugs we can give? Yes, atropine. Okay, it's going to be uh, the common one. You guys are familiar with the Mark I kit that contains two milligrams of atropine. And is it three or 600 milligrams? 600 milligrams of 2 pyridoxine chloride. Atropine is most important. Okay, <coughs> atropine is most important. And we tend to start at 2 milligrams, and then we double the dose until we get atropinization. And what do we look at for atropinization? Right, do they start drying out? Does our heart rate come up? Okay. Do their bronchospasms go away? We may need to give them beta agonists as well for the bronchospasm. Okay. So you start at two milligrams of atropine, you wait a couple minutes, give them four, eight, 16, 32, et cetera. You might need a lot. Some, uh, there have been reports of people that have need, needed thousands and up to tens of thousands of milligrams of atropine. Yeah. Some of these. These insecticides, uh, some of these agents are very lipid soluble. And so they go into your lipid compartment and then they just leak out of the lipid compartment over days and weeks sometimes. Um, and guess what? Worldwide, this is the most common cause of toxicological death worldwide. Is, yeah, why? Well, when people kill themselves, they tend to kill themselves with things that are readily available. If I'm in a rural village somewhere, I may not have access to Tylenol or acetaminophen, or to acetaminophen or aspirin or to opioids, right? But what do I, what do I have access to? Insecticides. Insecticides. So I'm going to eat a bunch of that. Um, in the United States, right, we're not particularly agricultural anymore here in the U.S. for the most part. But what do we have access to? Opioids. Aspirin, Tylenol, right? Yep. Alcohol, ethanol. That's what people overdose on. But worldwide, this is one of the biggest killers, people um, overdosing on, on uh, insecticides. Okay, 2-PAM, what is 2-PAM chloride, 2 polydoxine chloride, what does it do? What it is supposed to do is it's supposed to interact with that nerve agent and um, it, is, it is supposed to reactivate acetylcholinesterase, okay? So it kind of pulls that nerve agent off of the active site of the acetylcholinesterase enzyme and reactivate it. The problem is nerve agents can undergo something known as aging where they will bind to the acetylcholinesterase and then additional chemical bonds occur that permanently bind it to that enzyme. Once those chemical, chemical bonds occur, that is what we call aging. And 2-PAM chloride will be completely ineffective once aging occurs. Sometimes aging can take hours, and sometimes, um, such as the case with Soman, if, um, if somebody gets exposed to Soman, it takes about two minutes to age. Once that happens, 2-PAM chloride will be completely ineffective, right? Um, and next, the reason I'm bringing this up is this was a major agent in the Russian arsenal. Because basically what happened in World War II is um, the West was coming from one side of Germany, Russia was coming from the other side. And so all the technology that the West got a hold of on one side became technology that they used i.e. sarin, right? Sarin and cycloserin was a big part of our chemical weapons arsenals mm -hmm.
because those were the, the factories that we ran into, whereas Russia, okay, ran into the Solman. And so that became a big part of their arsenal. Right? We, we, the, that technology is reappropriated. But Solman has a very fast aging time. And so if, you, if you're worried about that, there is a pretreatment kit. And what we do is we actually poison yourself a little bit with a carbamate, something called pyridostigmine. And carbamates are, um, these do not age. That's a diff major difference between a carbamate and an organic phosphorus is carbamates do not age. They are um, reversible. So they bind to the acetylcholine and then they, they release. Okay, they're very reversible. They're not permanent like the organic phosphorus. And so what do you do is you, is you poison yourself and it, to where about you know, 20 or 30% of your acetylcholinesterase is poisoned by a carbamate. And then if you get attacked by Selman, right, because it ages so, so quickly, it'll, it'll take out about 70% of your cholinesterase, right? But because that pyrostigmine is reversible, you still have you know, a good 20% left over that can still function and work. That's that's the that's the theory behind um, the pretreatment kit. Practice, who knows? So upon aging, is there anything, anything nothing. you can do? Nothing. Your body has to produce a whole bunch of acetylcholinesterase, and that can take a while. Right? So that's just atropine and supportive care. Atropine and supportive care. Yeah. I mean, you, you give two pam chloride because you don't know, right? We often don't know. But you know you can't you can't anticipate that it'll work, yeah. And this, so this may be a case where you're giving lots of atropine, lots of support care. Is someone who's really sick? They're not getting better, yeah. But generally, if it's a carbamate that they've overdosed on, they will get better. You know, uh, they tend to be a lot le a lot less serious than, than that. You guys cool with that? All right, moving right along, anticholinergic. So this is anti-acetylcholine. This is blocking acetylcholine receptors. So I think of this as kind of the opposite of cholinergic. And drugs that cause anticholinergic toxidromes are atropine and atropine-like molecules. So belladonna, jimson weed, hyoscamine, scopolamine, right? These are uh, common antiemetics and motion sickness drugs. These are actually isomers of at atropine is actually a racemic. When we say something is atropine, it's a racemic. It's a mixture of, I believe it's hyoscamine and scopolamine um, are the two enanthemers. Uh, Benadryl, diphenhydramine, has significant anticholinergic activities. And then many other agents. There's actually a weaponized agent called BZ. Um, it's something known as an incapacitating agent um, that basically a large enough dose will incapacitate people but not necessarily kill them. So what are the classic signs and symptoms of an anticholinergic? Well, I just think of your patients, they, they are mad as a hatter, so they have altered mental status. They are fast as a hare, so they're very tachycardic. They are blind as a bat, they have medriasis big old dilated pupils. They are dry as a bone. Their mucous membranes are dried out. And they are hot as Hades. They are hyperthermic. So their temperature is high. Their mucous membranes are dried out. They have dilated pupils. They're tachycardic. And they have altered mental status. Does that make sense? All right. All right. So how do we treat these people? Supportive care, guess what? <laughs> Benzodiazepines, if they're very agitated, they need them. Possibly active cooling, if they're very hyperthermic. Possibly physostigmine. And remember, physostigmine is a nerve agent, right? So you're going to increase acetylcholine levels. It's a carbamate nerve agent. It may work. If you're in the hospital and the doctor wants to give neo neostigmine, say no. Neostigmine will not work for anticholinergic overdose. Why? Because neostigmine is a charged molecule and it can't get into the brain. It can't get into the, near, the central nervous system where it needs to work. Okay, but, but uh, phosostigmine can. Again, both of which are out of our scope of practice, of course, but there you go. All right, you guys okay with that? Okay. Um, so J-weed is one that you can find around here, right? 
the leaves, the jimson weed leaves. You make a tea out of it, drink it. Um, not really common, but you do find it. Belladonna is another plant. Um, this is where atropine actually comes from. Does anyone know what belladonna means? Yeah, it's a, a pretty, basically pretty lady or pretty woman. And what would happen was the um, uh, the the, uh, the prostitutes of uh, times past would put um, extract of this plant in their eyes, and it would what would it do to their pupils? It would dilate their pupils, and I guess that was considered attractive. Um, I guess it still is because a lot of people like those cartoons where like they, everybody has those really big eyes, right? Huh, yeah, yeah, the Japanimation, there you go. Yeah, like the big big eye, you know, apparently it's a cute thing, but there you go. Um, that's where that, that belladonna comes from, that pretty lady, is that they would actually use that, put that in their eyes, right? And, and, and in fact, occasionally this is still used today, right? Atropine-like molecules today, if anyone has ever had a dilated eye exam, right? There you go. Yeah, just a very local, local effect. Okay, you guys good with that? The next one is presents similar to anticholinergic, and they can get confused, but they are very different, and that is sympathomimetic. And these are drugs that mimic the sympathetic. Anticholinergic is not sympathetic, guys. Anticholinergic is blocking parasympathetic. Sympathetic is activating sympathetic. Does that make sense? Okay. They look similar in some cases, the signs and symptoms, but there are some very big differences. Okay, so you're mimicking sympathetic. That's your alpha-1, your beta-1, your beta-2, and your CNS, central nervous system excitation. What are some good examples? Cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines, bath salts, cot, meth mephedrine, okay? Okay, all of those fall, fall into that. Um, how do these patients look? They have, just like anticholinergic, an increased heart rate, an increased blood pressure. They are tachycardic, anxious. They may have a fever, midriasis, or midriasis, however you want to announce that. But the big difference is these people tend to be diaphoretic. Diaphoresis is a strictly sympathetic response. Okay? But if somebody is very hot and dry... That is more anticholinergic, okay? They're hot, dry, agitated, okay? That's more anticholinergic. If they're, they're hot, moist, agitated, okay, that is more sympathomimetic. Does that, that make sense? Okay. So how do we treat them? Just guess. Supportive care. Safety, supportive care, and... Benzodiazepines. Benzos play a critical role in a lot of our toxicology. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but cocaine is also has some other properties. It's cardiotoxic and neurotoxic due to the fact that it's a sodium channel blocker as well. And when you mix cocaine and ethanol, you can create a metabolite known as cocaethylene which is highly cardiotoxic. So it's not uncommon for cocaine overdoses to have present with chest pain, to present with ST elevation as well, present like a STEMI. So how would we treat them? Like a STEMI with benzos, right? So we would, we would nitroglycerin may very well be helpful for someone, okay? But we'd also give them benzos as well. Benzodiazepines are very helpful for our sympathomimetics. Okay, moving on to opioids. Okay, these are substances that agonized mu, delta, and kappa receptors. You've got your opiates, which are your naturally occurring, right? These come from the poppy. There's your natural um, morphine and codeine. And then your opioids are your synthetic and your semi-synthetics. Things like fentanyl, MS cotton, hydromorphone or dilaudid, hydrocodone or Vicodin, methadone, heroin, or diacetyl morphine, okay, and, and others. Um, and then you have some other agents that bind to specific receptors like um, loperamide or modium. What is a modium for? For yeah, for diarrhea. What do opioids do to your gut? They slow your gut down, right? They slow peristalsis. So modium 
is uh, it actually it binds to specific receptors in the gut primarily, like mu and uh, kappa in the gut. But if you take enough emodium, or enough emodium, you might have some crossover into the CNS and you can get some CNS issues um, occurring. Uh, you guys okay with that? And again, this is the number one issue in the United States and you guys are very well versed at this stuff by now because you deal with it so much. Um, how do they look? Well, they have respiratory depression, decreased pulse heart rate, and they have meiosis, right? Their pupils are constricted. So these patients look more like cholinergic. So anticholinergic and sympathomimetic can be confused. Opioid and cholinergic can be confused. But remember, cholinergic has the wet, sticky stuff going on, right? You don't see that as much as your opioids. How do we treat the opioid? Supportive care, care and then oh. naloxone with careful titration. You guys, you guys cool with that? All right. Mo yes. All right. Moving right along to the hallucinogenic. Okay. This one has significant crossover because can other agents be hallucinogenic? Sympathomimetics, for example, right? Methamphetamines, really good at causing psychosis. So when I say hallucinogenic, I'm talking about classical hallucinogens, okay? There are three categories of classical hallucinogens. The indole alkylamines or your tryptamines, your phenethylamines or what we call your substituted amphetamines, okay? Or your lysergamides, okay? So let's start at your indole alkylamines. These come from the amino acid L-tryptophan. And basically what it is, is it's a pyrrole ring. So you have this, this um, five-sided ring here with a nitrogen in it. That's called a pyrrole ring bound to a benzene ring. That's an aromatic ring. And then there's a hydroxyl group, alcohol group there. And then you have your amine. Okay? This is actually a molecule of serotonin. All of your endoalkylamines are serotonin-like. Their basic structure is that of a serotonin molecule. So guess what? Their major mechanism of action is going to revolve around agonizing serotonin receptors, specifically the 5-HT2A receptor. And these include drugs like dimethyltryptamine, um, psilocybin, bufotanine uh, or bufotanine. Um, DMT is sometimes known as NN, um, dimethyltryptamine, because you have uh, uh, methyl groups coming off of the nitrogen. Um, so that's what the NN means, a methyl on one, a methyl on the other. 5-methoxy-DMT, um, some people call this Foxy, Foxy-methoxy, okay, is a street name, okay. These are all indole alkylamines. The phenethylamines are substituted amphetamines, so guess what? They have a stimulating effect. They will cause an increase in blood pressure, an increase of heart rate. And some people actually call these psychostimulants. And these have a little more dopamine effects. They're more dopaminergic. They do have serotonin effects, but there's some dopaminergic effects as well. They affect dopamine pathways like amphetamines do. Um, and these come from the amino acid phenylalanine as opposed to L-tryptophan. And so you only have one benzene ring here. You have your benzene ring and then your amine side chain there. And this is actually a molecule of mescaline here, but mescaline and MDMA, or a methylene deoxymethamphetamine, is MDMA, okay, are also known as ecstasy. Um, mescaline uh, tends to come from plants like the San Pedro cactus and the peyote um, cactus, all right. And these have, again, dopamine agonism as well as varying degrees of serotonin receptor agonism. And then your lysergamides um, are a four-ring structure, tetracyclic. You have a pyrrole ring, a benzene ring, and then these other two rings coming off of it. And these actually come from the ergot fungus. No, no. Well, I mean, mushroom is a fungus, but ergot fungus, guess what? It infects grains. Grains. And in fact, this is um, one of the, the, the possible um, uh, connections with like the witch trials and all that was possibly 
some of the villages, if, if we go back to the history, it was like wetter than normal during the time of the year, and the grain may have gotten contaminated with this fungus. People ate the grain with this ergot fungus and then hallucinated, and and then they got burned as well. They got uh, hung and you know tortured and all that as witches. Um, so this may be some of what what went behind the witch. Yeah. Does that, do those fungus, if you breathe in the spores or anything, will cause the same thing? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, possibly, yeah. Like, so that's like, 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 can find like grain elevators and things like that. In addition to hypoxia, you want to be careful about, yeah. Yeah. So, um, LSD, L, L, uh, L sergic acid diphthalamide is, is the common one. Okay. Um, there are other examples too, like belladonna. We just got done talking about that. Anticholinergics are very good at making hallucinate. Um, tetrahydrocannabinoids. This is hashish and marijuana, right? They, they bind to CB1, CB2 receptors. Um, PCP, phencyclidine, and ketamine um, uh, involve NMDA receptors and methyl diaspartate um, receptor antagonism. And what's particular with PCP, safety is a big one, right? These can be very violent. Um, kratom can cause some, uh, has some mild hallucinogenic activity, and these bind to the mu opioid receptors. Um, there's a whole stink going on right now with Kratom. I believe the DA is trying to schedule it, and you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Salvia, you guys ever heard of salvia? Salvia divinorum, sometimes smoked. Um, and this uh, appears to activate um, kappa opioid receptors and dopamine 2 receptors. Okay, So those are just kind of some others. In general, how do these patients present? They can present very differently from drug to drug, but in general, you may have hallucinations. You can have fear, anxiety, panic. You can have things like synesthesia. What is synesthesia? Feel. It's actually crossing of the senses. So you um, you can you you can, for example, um, you can see sound. You can um, taste vision. Um, it's very difficult to explain, and maybe I I, I really hesitate to do this because I don't. Um, I don't want to be, be come off as like I'm um, I'm necessarily condoning anything, but I do have some video um, that was taken of me, um, um, frankly tripping balls like <laughs> bad. Like um, um, it's it's it, but um, I actually am experiencing synesthesia, and I'm attempting to I'm um, sobbing and attempting to um, describe what's going on. And basically, what's happening was I. Was, the universe had become sound, and I was somehow seeing sounds. It was completely dark. I was somehow seeing all this. It was weird. It's and again, it's a real weird thing. And again, I, I really hesitate to, to show that stuff because you know that's not the. That's good uh, experience right there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, it's something like that. Again, I don't. But then I don't want to come off as condoning or anything like that. And like I said, the experience was done in a, in a, a setting where it was actually legal and and, and all all that stuff. But uh, it is very curious to see some, uh, you know, to see that. Um, in general, the hallucinogens, the classic hallucinogens, are not toxic. In the, in the classical sense, they're not like physically, um, with the exception of the the phenethylamines, specifically like MDMA, can, and we've talked about some of the specific issues associated with that. But these tend not to be physically toxic. The the problems tend to be more psychological, right? with the, the anxiety and the panic. Okay, so guess what? How do we deal with somebody if, if you come, you know, if, if you're dealing with somebody that may have a hallucinogen on board, how do we deal with them? Relax. Right, supportive care, safety, calm, supportive environment. Okay, and if they're really agitated, benzodiazepines, how about that, right? Okay, benzos and supportive care, good, um, good. Okie dokie. Uh, you guys, you guys, okay with that? Does that, that kind of make sense? All right. <coughs> All right. Moving right along, and then finally, the sedative hypnotics, and these tend to cause general CNS depression. Okay, and often, how do they work? By a GABAergic mechanisms. Okay, and there are two major categories of sedative hypnotics. You have your benzodiazepines, and you have your barbiturates. Some examples of benzodiazepines, Xanax or Alprazolam, Valium or Diazepam, Ativan or Lorazepam, and you guys are familiar with some of these, right? Because 
we have some of these in our scope of practice. How about rohypnol? Have you guys ever heard of rohypnol? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah these are actually common date rate, quote unquote date rate drugs. Ro rohypnol are sometimes known as roofies. Okay. Um, uh, when I when I first went when I was in college in the back in the 90s, Xanax was a common agent that people were trying to use, um, uh, right? Trying to slip in, into somebody else's drink, and hopefully, if you guys go out and drink in a social setting, you guys are you know very cognizant of of that. And um, did you see those guys that just came out with that nail polish? Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Oh yeah, they dip it. Yeah, and it, and it, it yeah, it yeah. But boy, how? But you know that the whole spectrochemical thing. How does that cover all of them? No, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, or could somebody put There's some fentanyl another, or? Another yeah. thing. Yeah. They went around and just within. Be careful. I mean, even if you're sitting right there with your drink right there, yeah. and you turn for two seconds and say something to your friend and come back. And yeah. They yeah. stop. Yeah. So I think yeah, I think the moral of the story stop. is like, wait, I just poisoned I party just, with friends or don't just drink. don't party. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just don't drink. Yeah, just don't drink. Yeah, don't don't do it. Don't drink. Um, but yeah, um, so benzos and then the barbiturates as well. These tend to be a bit more rare because we don't see them as much. But phenobarbital is a classic example of a barbiturate. Barbiturates tend to be fairly significant when compared to benzos because barbiturates at higher doses have a direct effect on the GABA receptor, whereas the benzos tend to be more allosteric in their mechanism. How do these patients present? Pretty similar to opioids. May be very difficult to differentiate these from op opioids, actually. Okay, very similar to opioids. Um, but remember, with the benzos, they often tend not to be quite as bad as a significant opioid overdose. They can be, but, but not necessarily. Um, ethanol at high enough doses will also act as a sedative hypnotic, but it's a little different in that it can inhibit um, areas of the brain that are associated with what? Impulse control, right? So... Um, Whereas somebody who's overdosed on phenobarbital tends to be depressed all over, someone who's overdosed on alcohol, yeah, the risk for danger is a little higher there, is a lot higher. So you want to be careful there with, with, with ethanol. But certainly high enough doses of ethanol will what? Could certainly um, cause enough depression that could be life-threatening as well. Um, how, so how do we deal with these patients? Supportive, Supportive care. care keep them safe, rule out differentials, right? Get a blood, get a blood sugar on anybody who has any sort of altered alteration, of course. Um, Ramazacon in very special cases only, right? So if it's a little two-year-old that came into the ER, broke his arm, and we're going we're gonna to reduce that fracture in the ER, and they gave him a little too much of her sed, and now he quit breathing or bagging for him, well, that might be a great candidate for Ramazacon as opposed to a 52-year-old male who takes Xanax, you know, every day um, to sleep um, and then overdose on their Xanax, that might be a, a, a more, a, 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 a candidate, or a, not a candidate for that kind of medication. You guys, <clears throat> excuse me, you guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. All right, so that is toxicology part one, the general stuff. Next Monday, when I get back, we will talk about the specifics, and then we will also talk about some envenomation as well. Um, specifically, in the United States, the crotalids are the biggest problem, the pit vipers, and then there's only one type of elapid, coral snake. Uh, the coral snake, yeah, which is the, the neurotoxic venom. Um, and then the crotalids can be neurotoxic, proteolytic or a combination thereof if you're talking about something like the Mojave rattlesnake. But we'll talk about that. Um, and then, you know, there's just like some spiders, but those are just not very common, like the black widow. I mean, there's classic signs and symptoms, but it's not common. The brown recluse, um, again, brown recluse bites aren't particularly common. And most people who think that they're suffering from a, a necrotic spider bite, guess what they have? MRSA, yeah. 
they have a they have a they have an abscess and they just think that a spider bit them because it kind of looks like that but you know it's actually um a MRSA a MRSA or a VRE it's sort of drug resistant the rule in my hospital I worked in was if you say it's a spider bite you didn't actually see the spider bite it's MRSA it's MRSA or VRE yeah it's a, it's a drug resistant staff until proven otherwise yeah yeah because that's much more common than a than a brown recluse um, spider bite so there you go there you go okay uh you guys good with that with the stuff we talked about today all right um let's stop it here